This is uh, Fei Yi Wang. Uh, I'm from Oak Ridge National Lab. And uh, today, I'm going to give a high-level uh, introduction to the parallel I.O. in HPC environment. Uh, HPC I.O. is a rather broad subject. And I'm hoping to cover the following. Uh, first of all, I will introduce some general concept related to the HPC I.O. environment and the basic mechanism to achieve I.O. parallelization. Then, I will look at I.O. from three perspectives, from end user or applications perspective, from the storage system designer's perspective, and from performance perspective. So together, I'm hoping to establish a end-to-end -end view on the system and to help you to gain a deeper understanding on what's going on underneath. Therefore, you can set the right expectations on what is possible, and should the problem arises in the future, you know where to look for information. Speaking of HPC IO, besides the programming API, the first thing comes to mind might be the parallel file system, also known as the PFS. Just to be clear, the HPC IO is more than just PFS, although the PFS is indeed a critical piece and it, it is the first user interaction point. So at the very high level, the PFS is logically composed of three components, the PFS client, the metadata services, and the IO services. The figure here trying to illustrate how these different components are related to each other. So let's start from the compute node where your application are running. The PFS client are beneath the application layer and handles your I.O. request. If this I.O. request is a metadata operation, let's say you create a file or delete a file, or you modify certain files attributes, let's say the access bits, that all belong to the metadata operation, and it will be relayed to the metadata services to handle. And if this I.O. request is about reading data or write data, then it's likely to involve the I.O. services to actually do the data input and output. Another thing to note here is all the requests and the response will traverse through a high-performance net network fabric. So different PFS have different ways of organizing these functions, but by and large, the general idea of it, as well as the flow of it, are quite applicable. PFS share a common set of characterizations. First, it usually supports the so-called global namespace. What that means is it doesn't matter which compute node are allocated in your job. When your application starts, it can see a consolidated and a consistent view on the file and the directories. The PFS is also designed with parallelism and the scalability in mind. What that means is it supports the concurrent access from tens of thousands client, and it also supports end-to-one and end-to-end access pattern. End-to-one means if you have n files, you access if you have n number of processes, you access a, a single file, that is n to, n to 1. And n to n means if you have n number of processes and you have n number of files to access. I will have more to say in the follow-on slides about this. The PFS is also said to be high performance. From the network hardware side, it usually means we go beyond the conventional Ethernet and use, let's say, InfiniBand technology for better latency as well as bandwidth. 
and software-wise, it often makes use of a highly customized operating system, along with highly tuned network protocol stack for maximum efficiency and scalability. PFS also claimed to be POSIX compliant. Here, it does not really mean 100% POSIX because that would be difficult. As far as file system POSIX compliance goes, what that means in a nutshell, you can access the system with a file interface and the issue open, read, write, close system calls to it. The PFS is different from desktop or laptop file system. Those file system usually are referred as the local file system. In addition to the obvious complexity involved, another notable characterization of that is the PFS is a highly contested and shared resource. Uh, with some except exceptions, the performance isolation and the quality of service are not quite there yet. So to, a, to some degree, it's the, similar to the internet, it's the best of effort service. But worse than internet, a misbehaving application, more precisely the workload it generates, can actually degradate the overall I.O. system performance. And that's why the operational team often put in all kinds of filters and alarms to monitor it once such jobs are, uh, are identified or be terminated to, uh, to mitigate the effect. The PFS, th th there are multiple flavors of PFS, and the most popular choices are Luster and uh, GPFS. But um, other systems such as Ceph, uh, et cetera, are on the table as well. Another crucial concept I want to cover is how do we exactly achieve IO parallelization? So at the logical level, a file content can be regarded as uh, unstructured streaming bytes of data. And uh, from the PFS client point of view, this data can be chunked into pieces and passed through a data placement algorithm and to decide where this is going to be stored at. And that eventual destination is also known as the search target. The data placement algorithm can be as clever as it's needed, for example, it can take into topology and the locality into consideration. It can also take the failure domain into consideration so that the different replica of the data can go into different failure domain to be fault tolerant. And it can also be as simple as has been drawn here. You just spread out those data chunk in a sequential way. And the, although I draw the search target here as a single disk, but more often than not in practice, multiple disks are going to be bundled together using read technology to store extra parity information on it. This is to improve both the performance and the reliability. And the different uh, PFS have different ways of deciding what would be what they call the how, how do you break up this data. The size of the data often called the strap size and how wide you can strap the data often called the strap weight. And some PFS try to automate everything to simplify. Some PFS will try to provide you more control point. And this can have a major implications on the performance. For example, if the default striping width is one, and you take that as it is without modification, it does not matter how many processes you have at your application, and you are going to be bounded by the performance of that single search target. 
If you have worked with the luster before, you might relate the search target as the OST and the, the, the software running on top of it as the OSS. And if you come from the GPFS world, that's more akin to the global, uh, what they call the network shared disk, NSD and uh, NSD uh, server. But all in all, this general concept at, uh, on the striking pattern are quite uh, applicable across the board. Before I move into the programming perspective, are there any questions? Remember, if you have any questions, please put them into the Google Doc or into the Q&A tool. So let me uh, move, move on to the programming perspective of uh, Parallel. So basically, the task at hand is that we want to persist some amount of data as quickly as possible and as reliably as possible. So in HPC, we have many choices. It can be as simple as the POSIX IO or MPIO or parallel NetCDF and HDF5. So I don't have the detailed programming script to illustrate all of these choices, but I did provide a reference link at the end of the talk. They usually have more thorough tutorial and uh, documenta documentations than I can have uh, within this talk. Another choice is, is, uh, is a, another well-known choice is called Adios. It's a middleware solution. So the key idea uh, for Adios is it provides a richer set of API as well as optimization. Along with the configuration directives, you can adapt your IO to make use of other uh, underlying libraries. It's, it, it basically insulates you from binding to a particular API, but the downside of it, you need to have to learn a new API. And for the really complex IO requirement, you might, uh, it might be helpful or even necessary to think about IO mapping. So essentially, you are doing the mapping from your application data model it could be 1D, 2D, or 3D array to the storage data model. It can be the file-based or object-based or whatever the third-party library provided model. And also another mapping takes place for this library or the file system to map to the eventual hardware, IO hardware. Not all the mapping are efficient for every single use case. So this is where the design trade-off have to take place. So next, I'm going to talk about three basic I/O uh, methods. Let's start with the serial I/O. So yes, you can do serial I/O in an HPC environment, and sometimes it even makes sense. So the idea is simple: all the processes will send their data to the master process. Uh, most commonly, it, this is a rank zero. And the master process will collect the data and the write data <coughs> to a file in a serial mode. So read can also take place in the reverse order. So let me first talk about the disadvantage of this approach. It's not terribly efficient, as you can tell. This is a two-stage process. Before you can actually do the I/O, you have to communicate. And, and the second, you have, it's not very scalable if the aggregate size, data size for the I.O. exceeds the memory of the master process, this approach might not be even feasible. So what's the, what's the use case for this? Let's imagine that you have a configuration file or some kind of stage in input file you want to share with many, many processes. And for every process to issue open, read, and close for such little amount of data, it might impose undue burden on the parallel file system. Instead, what you can do is you ask the master process to read in this file and do an MPI broadcast and share the information with the rest of the processes. And this essentially are translating a IO bound problem to a communication problem. And assuming that you have high performance interconnect network, 
this will be a acceptable solution to a certain use case. The second IO method we're going to talk about is file per process. So in this IO method, each process will write its own data to a separate file. So if you have n number of processes, you will end up with n number of files on disk. So that's why it's called n to n. So the advantage of this approach is it's simple to program and it can be fast. It's also very natural because you can clearly see where the parallelization uh, happens. The caveat with this approach is that as your application scales, you have to consider the many, many files you generate and its impact on the PFS, and in particular, the metadata server. For a single shared directory with many, many files, this is traditionally a weak spot as far as the performance goes. And the second caveat is that when you accumulated so many files, it's a little bit harder to manage when you want to do the post data analysis. If you want to archive this uh, set of uh, data files for long-term storage, say to HPSS, which is tape-based, and you probably have to tear it up before you do the transfer. And this could be a very slow process. That are, those are the costs that you might want to consider. And another, uh, the third IO method I want to mention here is the single shared file method. So in this access method, each process are going to write their own data to the same file. And you have to each, of course, each process will have to carefully calculate the offset to avoid overstepping on each other's toes. Because you end up with one single file, this is called the end to end mode. So the advantage of this method is you end up with a single file. It's very, very manageable. And with a relatively straightforward approach, you end up with a from decent to very good performance. So the caveat of this method is it, it very much depends on how the underlying library as well as the PFS can support this kind of a single shared file. And you may not get the best performance possible. So that to wrap up our discussion on the, uh, from programming perspective. So next we'll talk about the system perspective. So um, we do have a question from Eric at NASA Langley. He asks, I have several end-to-end -end reads and writes in my application. However, I can throttle the number of ranks that are hitting the disk at any one time. So 50,000 ranks aren't hitting the system all at once when we're running on 50,000 cores. I'm sure that system load and other factors, um, what factors come into play when determining how many ranks I should be allowing to simultaneously hit the I.O. system? What's a reasonable number for common systems such as Titan? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, you did can throttle and try to time it. Uh, there are, first, first, uh, first let me say, when we benchmark the file system, uh, obviously, we don't use, uh, I, I, I did plan to touch this point later on, but we don't use all 18,688 compute nodes available. And the we generally, for 2,000 compute nodes, we can pretty much approach the best performance we can get. And the, the, the other uh, caveat regarding the exact number and optimization you, you do for this type of system is it's very platform specific. Your experience again on the Titan platform may not be actually portable across to other systems. So that's another factor to consider. Great, thanks. So let me move on to the system perspective. So as it become evident now, the HPCIO system is a product of a combination of software and hardware. 
So uh, end-to-end IOP path is uh, it, it will be helpful for you to gain a deeper understanding. So what this graph show here are taken from uh, the, the Titan file system production system with some details removed. So let's say on the left side, you or application want to persist uh, a piece of data. So essentially this means your process are going to be launched from one of the 18,688 compute nodes. Each compute node has 16 physical cores, and you are going to be launched from one of those process. And that data will traverse through a 3D torus network and reach one of the IO routers. We have 440 of them. And from that router, it will traverse through an external infinity band network with 1,600 network ports. And it will, then it will reach to one of the 288 storage servers. From there, it will be passed through a internal network and get onto one of the disk controllers. Altogether, they manage about 20,160 disks. So the exact, the specific details of this traversal are not that important. What I want to convey here is from the place where the data is originated to the final destination it's going to be stored at. This is a long way to, to travel. And that's one of the major factors that introduce the, both the complexity as well as the performance variability. So how does knowing more about HPC IO system or its underlying structure help you to understand IO behaviors? So let me use the, uh, the storage paradigm uh, or evolution of it from Oak Ridge to illustrate this point. So back in 2008 or even before that, the Oak Ridge probably started with a single big simulation machine and we purchased a dedicated storage and file system with it. And over time, we found out that we might need a dedicated uh, data analysis machine. And we purchased that system along with the storage and the file system with it as well. And then we have the visualization need, we have another cluster. So this is simple and uh, natural starting point for many uh, systems. Over time, we have found out that many downsides of this pattern. Obviously, it has wasted resource. And also, we have to consider the procurement cost, where you have to spec out the system, you need to do technology evaluation, and you have to do the acceptance testing for it. It also has extra operational cost, which means you have to assign uh, individual HPC operation teams for it and possibly maintain a variety of hardware and software solutions. And one of the biggest inconvenience for user is so-called the data island problem, where uh, data generated on one system, and if you want to analyze it on, uh, uh, or visualize it on a different cluster, you have to move the data over, which is additional cost. So over time, we have made the paradigm shift to so-called the data-centric paradigm. So the idea of it is actually quite simple. Basically, we consolidated all the storage solution into this so-called center-wide file system. And whenever it makes sense, we'll mount this center-wide system on every other cluster. So the obvious advantage for this approach is it did address the data island problem, and many users likes it. But this paradigm is not without its own problems. For example, if you pay attention here, I put data availability on both pro, pro and cons. So let's talk about pro. In the old system, if I want to take, let's say, the computer machine offline for maintenance, all the data generated with that cluster will be gone, and nobody can access it. And with this paradigm, even if I take the Titan compute cluster offline, 
you can still access your data from other compute cluster, let's say the visualization or the analysis cluster. So in that way, we can say that we, we have improved the data availability. But on the minus side, let's say the center-wide file system itself needs maintenance. When I take that one offline, everybody loses access to their data. So put it in another way, the center-wide system, system, file system have a higher requirement on the reliability and the availability. And another factor to consider is on the mixed workload. So let, let, let's think about the use case scenario. A user make a, a reservation request and got hold of the whole Python machine, the biggest compute cluster in our center, which has 18,688 compute node. Does it make sense for the user or the application to expect to have the best or the peak performance uh, as far as I.O. goes? So if you think back in the machine exclusive pattern, that might work, but in this new paradigm, when you have mixed workload in play, even you have exclu exclusive access of that compute cluster, that doesn't mean you have monopoly on the share the resource or the file system. The other visualization as well as the analysis machine might put a different workload onto the system which will interfere with your own workload. So the, the mixed workload is really uh, a, another factor that has to be uh, taken into account. So just to summarize the performance uh, at the system uh, perspectives. So the system design is about the trade-offs. We pretty much make compromise every, everywhere. We make compromise on performance, capacity, scalability, availability, and of course the cost. And we have seen the complexity and the control of the IO end-to-end -end path is very much decentralized. And we also need to be mindful about the impact of mixed work IO load for the, for the application where the performance concern is paramount. It's really necessary to do a careful workload characterization. And also, of course, a lot of research are, when, uh, are going into the performance isolation uh, and the quality of service. So are there any questions? So we have one question, uh, which is revisiting the earlier one from another person, and so you may want to defer answering, but I'll I'll put it out there now so you can be thinking about it. Okay. So this is from uh, Evan Felix, and he asks, how does this hybrid approach between one-to-one uh, -one and end-to-one -one work? So if you're, you know, if you have a, a 18,000 processes and you want to write, you use only 2,000 of them at a time to write because that maxes out the system. Essentially, how do you how do you work that out? Oh, can I talk about that uh, at the end of the talk? Yes. Yeah. So let me finish the last subject I want to cover, which is the performance perspective. So when people talk about their performance numbers, the first question I want to ask is what kind of performance you are going to talk about. So we often benchmark the performance at the three levels, starting, uh, not really starting, but application level performance, file system level performance, and the block level performance. Let me say a little bit more about the block level performance. What that means is, given a set of raw disk and their controller, the bare hardware, what kind of aggregate performance we can get without the overhead of the file, level, file system. So that usually represents the upper bound on how the system can do. And each level above will add a certain overhead to it. And in addition to this different level of performance, we need to consider the access patterns. Are you doing sequential read and write? Are you doing random read and write? Are you making use of small files, a lot of them, or are you using big files? And are there any mixed workload in play and could potentially interfere with your own workload? 
So what I found is having or trying to establish a mental picture on your performance characterization can go a long way to identify and clarify your potential error problems. So some of the general observation are the end user experience performance wise is a little bit less predict predictable in HPC compared to your regular desktop and the laptop file system uh, for both the latency and the bandwidth. And I think the, uh, it should be pretty obvious now that the, the, the factors behind it. And also, it is very challenging, if not possible, to achieve the peak, peak performance when you're in a production environment. And this is also echo back to what I said earlier. Um, in one week, let me talk to the next point first. So a uh, compute overpowers the IO. And a fraction of the whole machine can actually overwhelm the underlying of a storage uh, platform. So I mentioned earlier when we benchmark the file system, we almost never use all 18,688 compute nodes. And we generally end up with about 2,000, between 2,000 and 4,000 compute nodes. And even for those compute nodes, we are not going to launch processes on each core. And we usually are making use of two to four cores on each compute node. And the more cores, on, more processes on individual compute node will just cause internal contention. Because if you think about it, this compute node have no directly attached disk. It usually go through a, uh, a network port. And that, that network port itself create a bottleneck. You do not really need all 16 processes to, to just saturate that single compute node. So this next two slides provide uh, just uh, some reference links to the previous terms I mentioned. And also one of them is IO characterization tool, which is kind of popular here uh, in the HPC centers version. We have it deployed on Titan. <coughs> and also some of the IO library and the middleware uh, reference links. So as a Final note, I should mention that HPC IO system is a fast changing landscape. For example, the non-volatile memory such as SSD are gaining popularities in both consumer space and enterprise space. So in HPC system, we do not or we cannot afford to have a wholesale transition to that yet. But in the next system, it's more likely you will see a form of it that is the burst buffer. So that's why we say that the storage system are trending to be both more hierarchical and more heterogeneous. And that extra layer of burst buffer means that the IO mapping I talked earlier will become more complex. And it really requires a concerted effort from both the end user, the application developer, the middleware developer, the storage system designer, and finally the system provider to tackle this new challenge and make the best use of it. So this concludes my IO talk. But before I take, can you repeat the previous question? Let me think yes, about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, this question came from Evan. So Evan, was following up on the previous discussion of um, how the um, how to work with a smaller set of nodes doing the actual I/O. If you don't want to have all 18,000 nodes on the system doing I/O, um, so he he says, how does this hybrid approach work? Um, so that a group of nodes, do you do you have some kind of submaster and you send the uh -huh. data to? one of these guys and then he is responsible for writing it out or things. Are there, you know, particular application strategies or is this something you would expect a library mm -hmm. to do for you? Yep. Uh, so that's a, that's a really good question. So there are, at least in, on top of my mind, there are two options you can think of. One option is 
if you are using the plain POSIX I.O., this will be a little bit more involved. You have to uh, you have to do the all the communication set, set it up as groups and do it yourself. And uh, a more approachable uh, way to address this is to take advantage of uh, MPIO. And in the MPIO, you can do one to one, but the recommended way probably is to use uh, uh, N to one. And as far as I know, the MPIO actually will have this aggregator built in. Basically, when when you do the M21, it does not exactly say all the processes are actually doing all the I/O and hitting on the disk. They provide a config configurable aggregator count. Basically, are doing the aggregation data for you. So even if at the upper layer you are doing fairly small I/Os, the aggregator underneath it is doing the aggregation for you and collect those small I/Os and then do the uh, I/O output. So in, uh, to some degree, this is not neither N to N or N to 1 anymore. It's more like M to N. M is the number of aggregators in the middle. So uh, I would think that that will be a better way uh, to address the issue. So you don't, as a programmer, uh, application programmer, you don't necessarily have to do all of this yourself. You exactly. can rely on a library like MPIIO Yes. to do this for you. And another option will be uh, 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 the middleware solution I mentioned earlier, Adios. As far as I understand, Adios can pretty much do the same for you. It can use MPIO, that kind of shared uh, structure, or, or you can use uh, Adios' own aggregation function to do that. It will improve the performance in that particular case. Yeah. Um, so we have one more question, but Faye, can I also ask you to bring up the summary slide? Okay, um, actually, maybe we need to go back for this question to your slides. So um, question is from Michael. He says, uh, so in your one of your next to last slide or so, you have this thing about X, this question that you're asking about X, Y, and Z. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah. he asks, uh, do you have the statistics over the years of data output performance so that you could answer the XYZ question? Or is the standard deviation large enough that it wouldn't be meaningful? Uh, I don't, I, I remember that question. So I, I uh, just uh, for the person who, uh, for, for the folks uh, who don't remember the question, the question was often posed as, I have been allocated this X number, um, uh, X number of cores, and you said your system is capable of, of Y numbers, and why am I going only getting Z number performance? So uh, I cannot generalize the question or the answer to other platforms, but I, I, I can provide some guidelines for the Titan uh, or the Atlas file system uh, serving Titan. So um, what you can think is this. On Titan, we have all together 280, oh, no, not 200, 2,088 uh, storage targets known as the OSTs. And the, when we benchmark those OSTs, the general performance, the sequential read write performance can be as high as uh, 500 or more, at, let, let me be conservative, 450 megabytes per second on each storage target. And if you are talking about random workload on that storage target, we are talking about about one fourth of it, more like uh, 150 or 200. So now let, that's the what, what's beneath it. So if you are talking about the application level performance, you have to think about the kind of file you are dealing with. Are you talking about a single shared file? How large a strap of that file is being strapped out? And then you can do a aggregation and see how much performance you can uh, squeeze out of it. That probably represents the best performance of the upper bound. Your mileage will be very much varied, depends on the workload and the strapping pattern. I hope this makes sense to you. So if I can kind of summarize, um, one of the messages I think you've given in this presentation, if 
the, the IO systems are very dependent on the specifics of the platform and the specifics of the application. So if you're moving an application from one platform to another, you need to reset your expectations for the I.O. performance on that new system. And it sounds to me like one way to approach that would be to start by maybe talking to the folks that run that system and understand sort of what the maximums are, what the kind of benchmark numbers are in that slide that you talked about, the different levels of benchmarking. And, comp and then doing some experiments with your application to try to figure out the configuration that will allow you to achieve the, you know, what you can reasonably get out of that capability. Yeah, that's very much to the point. And also, when you do that kind of optimization for individual platform, you probably also want to be mindful about the application portability, where the optimization you do for one platform may not be that portable to another. And so there is a certain uh, cost involved. And also, as you said, different compute center, uh, they usually provide uh, some kind of a guideline on either their underlying uh, infrastructure or the back best practice for that particular platform. And the, some of the third party library, let's say HDF5, if you use that format, I remember, I remember on HDF5 FAQ, they have a, um, parallel uh, HDI5 uh, tips and tricks. It basically provides you a certain guideline on uh, different platforms, of, say, BlueGene, uh, Cray, et cetera, what kind of settings you might be able to tune for better performance. Very good. Are there any other questions from the audience? Give people a second to type it in. Um, and Faye, maybe you can switch over now to that last slide. Got just one closing slide and then I'm asking Faye to pull up. If anybody has any last questions, now would be a good time to let us know. Did you lose the other presentation? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I can do it from memory. Oh, I think I'm getting ready now. There we go. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, go to the next slide and then do a presentation mode. There we go. All right. So to everybody in the audience, thank you very much for participating. Uh, we're very interested in getting your feedback on this presentation in particular and the whole series. If you've attended others, so there's a Gmail address there that you can address questions and comments to. Um, that's hpcbestpractices at gmail.com. Uh, the plus session 06 will help us identify um, which uh, webinar it's associated with. You can also leave that out if you don't like typing too much. Uh, also, please visit this bit.ly link at the top of the page to make sure that you get counted as a participant here. We will be posting the recording online. The slides are already available online at the URL that's shown here. That's the registration site at the OLCF. And then I would finally like to note that our next webinar uh, will be about basic performance analysis and optimization. That will be Tuesday, August 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and the presenter will be Jack Deslip of NERSC. So with that, I thank you all for your participation, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye-bye.